Um, so yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for the, the invitation to, to talk to you today about uh, CP violation and, and mixing in charm. Um, I think it's normal in, to start such a presentation with uh, some background about CP violation and mixing, but um, I guess since uh, everybody will have just gone through several lectures of, of flavor physics, I'll, I'll kind of assume you've I heard all of this and, and go rather quickly through the topics, but um, since I feel a bit strange not saying anything. Uh, so yeah, just the essentials, um, starting with the, the most basic. Uh, the charge parity transformation refers to exchanging a, a particle with an antiparticle and the uh, inversion of the spatial coordinates. Um, and so then, yeah, of course, if a, a process is not invariant under, under this transformation, that's what we, we refer to as a CP violation. And the, the CP violation in the, the quark sector comes from uh, a single irreducible phase of the, the CKM um, matrix, which is shown here and which, which governs the, the, the coupling between quark transitions. Um, and it's been expanded in this parameter lambda here so that you can, uh, it's a kind of convenient way of seeing the, the hierarchy um, in terms of the, the powers of lambda um, where you see the, the off diagonal elements uh, um, diminish in size uh, quickly. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and so carrying on, we can, can uh, generically write amplitudes in terms of a, a magnitude and, and uh, CP conserving and CP violating phase, um, such that when we look at the amplitude for the CP conjugate process, the, the sign of the CP violating phase changes and CP converse, can, conserving remains the same. Uh, and in the presence of multiple amplitudes, the, the CP if the CP conserving and CP violating phases differ, then we can get uh, um, differences in, in the, the rates for the, the two processes. Um, and yeah, as you can see, this, this depends on the, both of these phases being different in the two processes. Uh, and these Feynman diagrams show some kind of typical examples of, of uh, what these amplitudes might be for, for charm decays um, in the sort of processes I'll come back to later. Uh, first uh, in a tree level diagram and then um, a penguin diagram. Uh, and these play an important role in some of the analyses I'll discuss. Uh, and then just kind of the, the minimum for when we talk about mixing. Um, the evolution of, of these uh, neutral meson systems is, is described by uh, the usual time-dependent Schrodinger's equation, uh, where this, this first matrix um, describes the, the, the dispersive um, contributions in this other one, in this uh, gamma one, the absorptive. Um, and you can see two sort of typical diagrams here. Um, though in the, the charm system, um, both the dispersive and absorptive contributions are both the dispersive and absorptive parts are dominated by, by long distance contributions. Um, yeah, and the non-coincidence of the, the um, mass and flavor eigenstates uh, when you solve this Schrodinger's equation leads to neutral meson mixing, which is, is governed by the, this uh, mass and width difference, um, X and Y, which I'll be referring to uh, constantly. Yeah, and so how does CP violation manifest itself? Um, the most simple way, I guess, is in, in direct CP violation, which uh, occurs if these, these two amplitudes differ, where this is the, the uh, amplitude for, a, let's say, a D0 to decay to a final state F and D0 bar to decay to uh, F bar. Um, but we can also have uh, mixing induced CP violation, um, which can occur if uh, this Q over P, magnitude of Q over P um, differs from one. Uh, and also if there's, uh, it can occur in the interference between um, the mixing and decay processes. Uh, so yeah, just more specifically about the charm sector, what do these phenomena look like here? Uh, both are expected to be very small in the standard model, which is due to both the CKM matrix elements, the relevant CKM matrix elements, as well as the gym suppression. Um, and looking at the relevant CKM matrix elements, uh, which are shown here, this is on 
this is approximately six times 10 to the minus four. So we can kind of naively expect uh, to see CP violation asymmetries on the level of 10 to the minus three to 10 to the minus four. Um, yeah, and, and the, the mixing parameters are also expected to be quite small. Um, and I think this is kind of a, a fun plot to look at um, where you can can compare the, the the oscillations that one would see in, for example, the BS system, which are very fast, um, compared to the charm system, which are which are extremely slow. And note that this is on a log scale, actually. Um, and these, yeah, sorry, the the different uh, the different um, plot the different contribute the different uh, graphs on this plot are uh, the the probability of finding the the particle or antiparticle after a, a period of time and yeah and as i said this is partly due to the ckm matrix elements and partly due to the the gym suppression um in particular in the uh, the b system this is this is better broken due to the the, the much heavier top mass um which can uh, and in, in the charm system, this is uh, the, the the relevant contribution from the beauty quark is uh, doesn't doesn't break the gym suppression as well. Um, but yeah, both of these both of these uh, um, are expected to be quite small in the charm sector, which makes it very challenging from an experimental perspective, as it requires uh, control of systematic uncertainties at uh, very precise levels. Um, yeah, and more generally, we can ask why study these phenomenon. Um, uh, yeah, as everybody, I guess, is aware, the standard model of part of particle physics is clearly an incomplete theory. Um, one of the clearest examples, which is related to CP violation, is the the uh, is that the standard model is incapable of generating the observed matter antimatter asymmetry. Um, and meanwhile, many extensions can naturally include uh, new sources. Um, it's also worth noting that I think these, these sort of indirect probes uh, um, have often provided first glimpses of new particles where the gym mechanism itself was, was um, in, important in predicting the charm quark. Uh, and finally, these, these, uh, these processes are capable of probing quite high energy scales, um, as you can as is illustrated uh, in, in this um, plot, which shows uh, uh, limits set from, from different uh, KNs, charm, and, and beauty uh, measurements. And why study charm? Um, yeah, it's uh, CP violations relatively well measured in the KN and beauty system. Um, and so I think uh, that in and of itself is a reason for measuring charm so that we can have a, a make sure we understand what's going on in this system as well. And meanwhile, it's the only laboratory for studying mixing CP violation in, in mesons with uptype quarks. Um, and depending on the details of, of new physics models uh, and the, the, the flavor structures of the new models, the constraints from charm may actually be more powerful than, than in the other um, systems. Uh, and yeah, as I mentioned before, this expected CP violation is quite small. Um, and I think that this, uh, this can kind of make it more interesting from a possible signal over standard model background perspective in that uh, if we see large uh, mixing or CP violation in, in charm, it's, it's a very clear sign of uh, new physics contributions. Um, <clears throat> so with all of that said, uh, what's the current status of our knowledge of these um, of, of mixing and CPV. Uh, mixing has been observed. Um, both X and Y have been measured to be different from zero, uh, which is shown in this, this plot on the bottom left, um, where just as a reminder, X was the, the mass difference of the neutral meson eigenstates and Y was the decay width difference. Um, but and uh, in, in also CP violation in the decay amplitudes has been observed, um, which I'll discuss shortly. Um, but this has only been observed once, and, and more studies are needed in order to to try to understand if uh, if the observed CP violation is in line with our expectations. Um, and finally, 
mixing induced CP violation, uh, which are governed by this Q over P and the, um, the phase are, are, have not yet been observed. Um, and uh, yeah, CP conservation is, is this, uh, occurs at the origin here. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so you see we're consistent with it, but we're not yet, uh, we're not, our precision is not yet able to probe down to the standard model expectation, which is uh, a fraction of a, a degree. Um, so there's still plenty of room for, for new physics to show up there. Uh, so now I, I will finally start discussing the measurements a bit. And as a disclaimer, I'm, I'm focusing on LHCB for this, and that's because LHCB has made uh, a majority of recent results. Um, and also, there, I've seen that there's a Bell 2 talk tomorrow where hopefully um, you'll hear about uh, Bell 2 prospects for, for charm. Um, so yeah, what's the charm physics recipe uh, at LHCB? Um, so first, it's worth noting that the LHC produces a, a, an, an enormous amount of charm hadrons, about a million per second. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have the capability to save all of this charm to disk. Uh, so we first have a trigger which tries to select interesting events and suppress background and make the data rate more manageable. Um, this starts with a, a level zero hardware trigger, which looks for high um, PT and, and uh, energy signatures. Um, and then there's a, a high level trigger one, which does some partial event reconstruction and looks for high momentum tracks, which are displaced from the, the primary interaction region where the protons collide. Um, and then we're able to do a full alignment and calibration, which allows for a full event reconstruction still in the, the high level two trigger, um, where we can do a more sophisticated analysis and uh, eventually decide if we want to save it or not. Um, and uh, yeah, I should note that actually in the LHCB upgrade, which um, is being finalized now, we've gotten rid of this uh, hardware trigger, which will allow for more efficient triggering um, of, our, of our signal events. And once that's done, we need to um, separate the signal from background, which can either be combinatorial in nature or from similar decay modes. Um, we need to, for the analyses that I'll be discussing here, identify the flavor of the charm mesons at production, um, measure the, the time evolution, and, and often the kinematics of the decay products. And finally, understand how the detector response might bias these. Uh, which, yeah, that this is can be challenging to do, but the LHCB detector is designed for precision measurements of these these uh, of beauty and charm hadrons. So we're well equipped to meet these challenges. Um, first, we have the, the precision vertexing provided by the vertex locator detector, um, which has great impact parameter resolution, um, which uh, corresponds to decay time resolution of about a tenth of the, of the D0 lifetime. Um, then tracking stations, uh, which, uh, which provide important momentum measurements for, for separating the, the signal and also for measuring often the phase space uh, invariant mass coordinates of the, of the decays under study. Um, and another important part of this is the magnet, um, whose polarity we regularly change in order to try to minimize uh, systematic effects coming from um, charge detection asymmetries. Uh, and finally, the, the charged hadron identification, which takes place in the, the rich detectors um, and also the, the muon stations. Um, yeah. And so how do we actually reconstruct the, the charm mesons that we're studying? Uh, we make use of two mostly independent samples. Um, and we have, uh, in quotes, perfect tagging of flavor at production. Um, so the first comes from what I'll probably often call the prompt sample in which we have uh, excited charm meson, which decays at the primary vertex. And it decays through the strong interaction into the D0 and uh, a soft pion. And because this is the case via a strong interaction, the charge of the pion 
will tell us the the charge of the d or the, the flavor of the d star and less the flavor of the d zero. Uh, the other example is is from secondary samples or muon tagged samples in which the the charm meson comes from um, a B hadron decay, uh, which uh, in, in in this case the the flavor is tagged from the the muon. Um, each of these present different challenges and are useful for, for cross-checks. Um, I'll actually be focusing mostly on the pion tag sample just to, just to um, try to save time. Um, but it's, it's important to know that this sample exists, um, both because we use it as cross-checks and because it can actually be a, a dangerous background in the prompt sample. Um, so yeah, we need to control the, the cross-feed between these. Um, yeah, what does the data selection typically look like? Um, as I said before, we are, we're able to um, do a full event reconstruction still on the trigger. Uh, in, in there, we apply fairly simple candidate selection requirements um, that make sure that the tracks are, are reconstructed well. Uh, we know the, the particle, um, what kind of hadron it is. Uh, and we have some requirements on the, the transverse momentum uh, of the tract and the D0 candidate, as well as on the vertex quality and uh, impact parameter, um, which, uh, yeah, the impact parameter of the D0 is, is useful for disentangling the, these two samples. As in the prompt case, we expect it to point back to the primary interaction and then the secondary sample um, because the, the B hadron will carry it away, it will not necessarily point back. Um, yeah, and as you can see in this plot on the right, which shows the, the signal contribution with this large peak um, for uh, uh, D star decaying to D0 pi and the D0 to K minus K plus, we, we end up with uh, quite clean signals. Um, there's just a small uh, remaining background, which is mainly combinatorial in nature. Um, this plot might be a bit deceptive because there are other uh, non-combinatorial backgrounds which need to be considered. But overall, it, these, are, these are quite clean samples. Um, so yeah, the typical experimental challenges that we might face in these analyses. Um, the, the, the main one, which is common to everything, is understanding the detector response. And by this, I mean the, the acceptance effects or the um, efficiency with which we can reconstruct these. Um, we need to know how this will, for example, depend on the decay time of the, the D0 meson and understand how this will sculpt the, the data. Because especially for the time-dependent analyses where, where, where we want to look for the, the tiny effects of, of mixing, um, it's, it's, it's necessary to be able to disentangle what is coming from the, the detector and from the requirements that we're placing on these decays and what's coming from physics. Um, and also an important component is charge asymmetries, um, by which I mean, these can be det detection asymmetries due to the different interaction of, uh, of, of uh, let's say, um, a pi plus and a pi minus with matter. Or it could also be due to reconstruction asymmetries um, due to uh, different, um, different magnet polarities and different crossing angles of the, the, the proton beams. Um, and how do we deal with these different things? Um, Monte Carlo simulation would be uh, the ideal answer, I think, is, but uh, in, in charm, this can be uh, a bit impractical because uh, with charm, we're dealing with really huge samples, um, uh, anywhere from a million to uh, hundreds of millions of, of, of these decays. So in order to, to have simulation samples large enough to understand these effects, um, we need to generate billions and we need to uh, have enough confidence in our simulation that we, we, uh, that we can trust it to, to that level of precision. And so what we'll often do instead is look for calibration data. And this could be high statistics control, control samples where um, the physics effects are well understood. So an example of that, which is shown here, 
is the detection asymmetry of a k minus pi plus pair um, as a function of the, the kn momentum. Um, this isn't always possible, uh, but uh, we, we tend to use this where we can. Um, and finally, the, the, the last approach to dealing with these is just to design analyses and observables to be insensitive as possible to these effects. Um, yeah, so I'll quickly discuss now some time integrated measurements. And by that, I mean, where we're after um, direct CPV um, and the decay amplitudes. So the classical example for this would be measuring the differences in, in the decay rates to Kabibo suppressed final states. That's uh, either K plus K minus or Pi plus Pi minus. Um, and we define the uh, CPA symmetry as shown here, um, where we have the, the difference of the D0 and D0 bar decay rates divided by the, the sum. Um, experimentally, uh, it's, it's easy to measure what's actually a raw asymmetry from the number of reconstructed signal events. So we basically just count, um, count how many of these decays we see and how many of these decays we see in form the ratio and you get a raw asymmetry, um, which sounds easy, but uh, on, especially when you're, you're dealing with this clean of signals as I showed, but uh, unfortunately this doesn't correspond exactly to the, the CPA symmetry that we're after due to production and detection induced asymmetries. Um, and so to a good approximation, we can write these raw asymmetries as the sum of these, these different contributions. Um, so first there's the, the CPA symmetry that we're after. And then there's a charge dependent asymm there's two charge dependent asymmetries, um, which could come from material interaction reconstruction, as I mentioned before. Um, the first is from the, the final state of the D0 meson. And because we're dealing with just a two body decay, to symmetric final states, this is conveniently zero. Um, but I mention it anyway, because in, in other decay modes, this isn't necessarily zero. Um, and then there's the detection asymmetry of the tagging pi n, um, which is a, is a reminder, tells us the, the flavor of the D0 uh, at production. And finally, there's a, a, a general D star plus production asymmetry. Um, so in the, the spirit of trying to define observables to, to uh, make our lives easier, we, we can note by staring at this that if we, if we actually do form the difference of CPA symmetries, for example, with the K plus K minus and Pi plus Pi minus, um, that all of these except for the asymmetries which we're after uh, will cancel. Um, and conveniently, uh, naive expectations tell us that these, these asymmetries here um, will be roughly equal in magnitude, but with opposite sign. Uh, so this forming this observable allows us to cancel a lot of these nuisance asymmetries. Um, well, uh, hopefully forming an observable that's more sensitive to the signal we're after. Um, and I'm simplifying things a bit. It, it doesn't, it's not quite so simple, but uh, it's, that's, that's more or less the idea. Um, and so then we can use the invariant mass distribution of these uh, D0 these pi candidates, which I showed earlier for, in order to disentangle the, the signal components from the background of these, uh, of these uh, um, mainly combinatorial um, uh, particles, uh, combinatorial D stars. Uh, and then a simultaneous fit can be done to um, both the D star plus and D star minus, which will allow us to, to determine um, these, these uh, asymmetries. Um, and I include here plots from uh, a LHCP publication from uh, around three years ago now. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's, which uh, um, used the, the full uh, run to data samples. Um, and the result, when you combined both the pi n and the mu n tag sample, uh, um, for, gave, gave an LHCB run one and two measurement of the, the value shown here, um, which were also compatible with uh, um, uh, the, 
well, the, the run two results were compatible with the previous ones as well as the world average. And this was uh, at 5.3 standard deviations. This was the, the first observation of CP violation and, and the decay of charm hadrons, um, which was a milestone for, for charm physics. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it's a, a great example of constructing observables to be insensitive to some of these experimental effects. Um, so I'll just yeah, I quickly mentioned that what has been measured is a time integrated asymmetry. Uh, and it's actually possible to have contributions as well from CP violation and in, in mixing and the interference between mixing and decay. Uh, so this is what we measure and we'll have a direct CP violation contribution as well as uh, an indirect, which depends on the decay time. Um, and yeah, uh, so, so um, different measurements give us inputs for this, which I'll actually discuss later. Um, and we can do a, a combined analysis to get these, these results here for the current world average, which uh, have a no CP violation probability of um, less than five sigma, or more than five sigma, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, so now we want to know, is this, uh, is this in line with our standard model expectations or not. Um, and this is actually very difficult to say uh, due to low energy strong interaction effects making this difficult to calculate. Um, as the char meson is kind of in an awkward position where uh, you can't quite use uh, many of the tools that are used in, in the, the, the beauty system. Um, but it's renewed interest in trying to calculate these effects on the standard model. Um, and at the same time also uh, has given rise to investigations of possible enhancements from new physics contributions. And um, you can see an example of that here where a possible uh, set prime is proposed, which can um, avoid uh, other constraints coming from, for example, um, demixing. But uh, in the end, we'll need, um, in the absence of some huge theoretical breakthrough, we'll need more measurements to, in order to try to understand this better, in order to test relations between the CPA symmetries, um, constrain flavor SU3 breaking effects, and, and give information on the effect of final state interactions and strong dynamics. Uh, so, it's also worth noting that the measurement of the individual asymmetries um, will be very interesting to know. Uh, and this is something that indeed LHCB has measured in the past, um, not just LHCB, but uh, yeah. And uh, it's uh, updates of these measurements with the full uh, data samples are, are ongoing. And we'll also be very interested to see uh, measurements from even more decay modes. Uh, for example, we've recently published this uh, ACP K short K short, um, which uh, did, was not able to, to observe CP violation, but uh, um, is a promising channel with the, the upgrade statistics. Um, Multi-body decays, meaning decays to more than two particles are also very interesting to look at. Um, is the strong phase varies over the, the available phase space. Um, and you might remember from that, uh, expression that I showed at the beginning of this talk, the sensitivity depends on the strong phase uh, variations. So in multi-body decays, we can end up with some regions which have enhanced sensitivity. They do pose several challenges though, and one of which is you need to understand the detector response over the full phase space, as well as uh, understand the contributing amplitudes, um, which could be done uh, experimentally with an amplitude analysis. And you can see one effort that LHCB made to do that here with D to KK pi pi. Um, but yeah, these, these analyses are quite challenging to perform, not only to perform, but also to, to you know, um, thoroughly uh, assess systematic uncertainties associated with the model dependence and so on. Um, so there are also alternatives to this, which have been pursued, uh, model independent analyses. Um, but this has the downside that when you give this to theorists, then it's, it's less clear what to do with it because you don't, maybe you measure CP violation in some region of phase space, but it's not clear what amplitudes were really contributing to this. 
Um, yeah, so I will proceed now to discussing um, time dependent measurements. And so these are going to be mixing and, and uh, mixing induced CP violation. Uh, and I'll start with, I, I think the simplest example, the, the clear, a very clear sign of mixing um, would be uh, in, in the so-called wrong sign decays. Uh, so we can imagine a, a semi-leptonic D decay um, and a, a decay of a D zero to a K plus uh, L minus neutrino is, is not possible. So this, this decay, you don't see it unless it first mixes into a D zero bar and then proceeds to this decay. Um, so I think this is this is perhaps the one a very clear sign of mixing, and, and also quite easy to to see and, and vis visualize what uh, what's happening here. Um, and the expected decay rate can be seen here. Uh, and actually, the time integrated wrong sign to right sign ratio uh, uh, can be used to get direct access to the mixing parameters. And um, so actually, this doesn't need a time uh, dependent analysis, but I think serves as a, a good introduction to the more complicated case, which would be the D0 to uh, K minus pi plus. Um, and in this case, uh, we similarly have a right sign decay, um, and we similarly can have the D0 mixing the D0 bar and then decaying by the, the right sign decay. Um, but then, but we also have these these contributions of the of where the d zero can can also decay to the same final state um, via a doubly doubly Khabibo suppressed process process, um, and you can see the the relative suppression of the the Khabibo favored and the doubly Khabibo suppressed decays um, by by looking you can get a rough idea by looking at the the relevant uh, CKM matrix elements. Um, so in, in this case, if we if we look at if we if we form right sign samples, it will have just the Kabibo favored contribution. But if we look at the wrong side, it will have um, both doubly Kabibo suppressed and the the mixing followed by Kabibo favored. Um, and these two amplitudes will be able to interfere, and that gives rise to a, a bit more complicated. Uh, dependence of these ratios is a function of decay time, um, where uh, this this term, which is now linear in in time, as opposed to the the semi-leptonic expression before, which was quadratic, um, this this linear term uh, gives us more sensitivity to mixing, uh, but we now need a time-dependent analysis in order to um, get access to the mixing parameters, uh, and. Also necessary in this um, is, is to have uh, some measurements of the, the hadronic parameters of the D0 decay. Um, so you can see uh, how these, these RD and uh, delta parameters are defined here. Um, and also Q over P and phi, which you're familiar with from before. Um, but RD is the, the ratio of the doubly Khabibo suppressed the Khabibo favored um, decays and delta is the, the strong phase difference. Um, well, the strong phase difference between the, the D0 to K minus pi plus and D0 bar to K minus pi plus. Um, yeah, and so this analysis is, is, it gives better sensitivity, but it's, it's more complicated because we need to do time dependence and we need to have access to these hadronic parameters. Um, yeah, so to get the time dependence uh, and to get the dependence on the decay time, we again fit these D0 pi plus mass distributions, which you've already seen. Um, and we do this in bins of the D0 decay time and form the, the wrong sign over right sign ratio. Um, and these, these examples are taken from LHCB data up through 2016. Uh, and you see absolutely massive. Um, samples for the for the the right sign sample and wrong sign suppressed quite a bit as expected um, but still fairly large signal on top of uh, a large background um, yeah and then 
and then uh, we observe these these ratios as a function of decay time and fit them with the, the models that or the expectation that I, I showed on the previous slide. Um, and we do the fits under three different hypotheses. Uh, one in which um, uh, no CPV is allowed at all. Uh, one in which um, we allow for CPV in, in, in mixing, but not in the decay. And then one where everything is allowed. Um, and yeah, you can see the, the fit projections here for the, the D0 and D0 bar, and then a difference between them. Um, and you see a clear sign of mixing. In the absence of mixing, these, these would be constant. Um, but no clear sign of CP violation, which would manifest itself uh, via some slope in, in this. Uh, yeah, in practice, there's a bit more complications to the analysis, but I think it's a good illustration of the um, basics of this before moving to a more complicated example, um, which is the D0 decaying to K short pi plus pi minus. Um, and this is one of these multi-body decays, which I was referring to earlier, and which are interesting um, in direct CP violation searches, uh, and can also be interesting in these, uh, these mixing-induced ones for, for the same reasons, really. Um, this decay has a rich resonance uh, substructure, with, uh, uh, which results in varying strong phases across the, the Dalat's plane. Um, and then Dalit's plane is exactly what's shown here, uh, where the, the phase space of this three-body decay is parametrized in terms of the um, invariant masses of the k-short pi plus pair and the k-short pi minus pair. Um, and you can see the, the intensity of, the, of this decay um, throughout the phase space. Um, this is just the intensity, but uh, the strong phases are also varying across this. and. Uh, the, the pros of, of analyzing such a decay mode are that it give, gives good sensitivity um, and also would allow for direct determination of all of the mixing and CP violation parameters um, because uh, the, exactly because of this varying strong phase difference, which uh, differs from what we saw in the D0 to, to K pi example, where we have just one um, point and you need uh, some external input on that. Um, <clears throat> on what those that, that strong phase is. Uh, the, the disadvantage is that this requires a good understanding of the decay dynamics and the, the reconstruction effects over the Dallas plane, um, which is more or less what I also said for the direct CP violation case. Um, just to quickly expand a bit more on some of these acceptance complications, uh, the, the efficiency with which candidates can be reconstructed, for example, uh, is going to vary as a function of D0 decay time. Um, and this, I think, can be kind of understood with this cartoon that I drew here, where D0, which is coming from the primary interaction region, will fly some distance before decaying. Um, and as part of our, our uh, trigger selection, we have to require both that um, that these D0s will have uh, will pass some momentum threshold, and also that these uh, tracks won't point directly back to the primary vertex. Um, and these are these are both things that you expect from signal, and you don't necessarily expect from from background. Um, from you'll have a lot of background which will point directly back to the PV, have lower momentum, and so on. Um, so these these cuts make sense. Uh, however, it's it's kind of clear to see that if the D0 doesn't fly very far, um, then, for example, it's not going to be very displaced from the primary vertex. And the end result is that we have quite low efficiency for reconstructing decays with um, low decay times, where this, this is uh, in units of the D0 lifetime. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we need to be able to understand this in order to disentangle mixing effects. Um, and similar considerations hold for, for, for the phase space. Um, once again, these, these requirements will, will lead to variations over the efficiency to, that we can reconstruct these. Um, and in this case, this is because the, the the location on the Dallas plane is also correlated with the kinematics and, and the opening angle, 
opening angles between these. Um, so these, it's necessary once again to understand how how this uh, how these detector effects will will shape um, some already complex distributions over the phase space. Um, and as for understanding the decay dynamics, different approaches have been pursued. Uh, the, the first analyses by Bell and Babar used uh, amplitude models of the decays. Uh, and you can see what this looks like in these plots for the, the magnitude of the amplitudes and the, the strong phase variation. Um, these are challenging for reasons which I've mentioned already. Um, and so it's attractive to consider alternative model independent approaches, uh, which is what I'll discuss now. Um, so one such approach is the so-called bin flip method, uh, which is designed to minimize challenges of uh, associated with these detector effects, as well as the, the modeling the decay dynamics. So in this method, the data is binned according to the Dalit's coordinates. Um, bin the court as you see here, where the different colors represent different bins. Uh, and external measurements of the strong phase variation are used as constraints. And this avoids modeling the dyna dynamics of the D0 decay time. Uh, sorry, <laughs> dynamics of the D0 decay. Um, and uh, the, the, the strategy then is to, to examine the ratio of yields of uh, say this bin divided by this bin as a function of decay time. So it's like we're, we're doing this k pi wrong sign over right sign analysis uh, in several different bins at the same time. Um, so we, we determine these ratios for each of these bins as a function of decay time. And what's convenient about Doing that is that there's a cancellation of most of the acceptance effects. Um, these events should have more or less the same decay time. Um, and so that will cancel in the phase space efficiency, uh, the kinematics and these bins uh, will also be symmetric to a good degree and uh, will mostly cancel in the ratio. Um, and so this is uh, constructed to avoid complicated acceptance modeling. And these ratio of yields, as was the case with the D to K pi, um, will vary as a function of decay time uh, and give sensitivity to the mixing and CP violation parameters. Uh, and the slopes in each bin are determined by the interplay of the, the hadronic nuisance parameters uh, and the, the mixing parameters, um, where RB, uh, these is, this is similar to, to what we saw in the uh, D to K pi case is the ratio of, uh, of one bin by the other. And then we have this linear time dependence uh, that gives sensitivity to X and Y. Uh, in these S, B, and C, B, I'll discuss shortly. These are the strong phase differences, which uh, um, again are analogous to what we saw in the D to K pi case. Uh, so we need the strong phase input and that comes from external measurements, as I said. Uh, these are determined with good precision from quantum, quantum correlated DD bar pairs. Uh, and we're, uh, yeah, we use these uh, measurements from Clio as well as uh, measurements from BEST3. Um, and you can see then how these, these parameters uh, vary for different bins. Um, and I should mention that these bins were, were defined so as to keep uh, nearly constant strong phase differences within a bin. That's on 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, and yeah, there's, there's uh, one more efficiency complicate. Well, okay. <laughs> there's one efficiency complication, which unfortunately the bin flip method doesn't naturally handle. And that's that the trigger requirements correlate to the Dodds plot coordinates with the decay time. Um, I kind of explained earlier how, how these affect both the Dalit's plot efficiency and the decay time efficiency. And unfortunately, it can uh, actually create correlations between them such that um, the Dalit's plot efficiency will actually uh, evolve as a function of decay time. Um, but we've come up with uh, data-driven methods to handle that. Uh, fortunately, this effect is symmetric with respect to the Dallas plot bisector, um, 
which uh, these these are these are basically charge charge conjugate regions, um, unless these are insensitive to oscillations moving events from from one side to the other. Um, so what we can actually do is use the data itself to get relative efficiencies of the the symmetric regions uh, of these symmetric regions throughout the phase space. Um, and this does have a small effect from Y, uh, but this is uh, taken into account when we, we make these corrections. Um, there's also detection asymmetries, which uh, I'm, I'm going to skip because I'm running out of time. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, there's this contaminations of the, the muon tagged sample. So these are charm hadrons coming from B decays. Uh, and these are controlled uh, using um, the impact parameter, where we, we determine as a function of decay time uh, the fraction of events coming from uh, B decays. Um, and this will, will grow. Uh, the fraction of these will grow as a function of the D decay time. Uh, so yeah, that's the more complicated expression for the measurement. And I'll just point out that we, we form these ratios uh, for both uh, the D0, initially D0 and D0 bar pairs. And yeah, then we fit our we fit these ratios with our models um, and determine uh, yeah we we determine the yields in each mass and decay time bin form the ratios and fit them with our models, as was the case with the d to k pi um, departures from a constant value uh, indicate mixing, and we see that uh, yeah <laughs> the data is clearly incompatible with mixing, and additionally uh, we we run a fit in which we fix x the mass difference to zero. Um, and we see that it's clearly incompatible with x equals zero as well, um, which was uh, relevant because before this analysis, x was still compatible with zero. Um, and as I mentioned, we also uh, do this separately for D0 and D0 bar to allow for a CP violation creating differences between them. Um, but as we see from the differences between the two samples, these are, these are consistent with zero. Um, yeah, the, 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 the analysis is dominated by statistical uncertainty, um, although some systematics, such as the reconstruction and selection, are getting sizable. Um, we have experimental improvements foreseen with larger samples, which will, which will help to reduce these. Um, and we're also looking forward to larger samples from BEST3, uh, which will ensure strong phase uh, inputs will not become the limiting factor. Uh, yeah, and these were, we interpret um, the, the, the fit results in terms of Q, X, Y, Q over P and Phi. And I'll just, as I noted before, this is the first observation that X differs from zero um, and was the most precise measurement of X in the CP violation parameters. And this is a bit outdated, but this illustrates the, the power of this decay mode where these, these uh, this shows the knowledge, the current world average before this result and then after. Um, and you see that it, it almost yeah, basically dominates the, the uncertainty on X. Um, yeah, I was, yeah, I, in this, this sort of um, technique of, of, um, of analyzing these multi-body decays in regions of phase space can also be applied to other samples. In particular, there's been a, a, a binning scheme as well as measurements of strong phase proposed for D to K3 pi, um, which you can find at that archive link. And uh, we're looking forward to, to these measure being, measurements being utilized because this, this mode will also be able to provide uh, really nice constraints on the mixing and CPV parameters. Um, I was going to talk about a few more <laughs> measurements, but I've gotten apparently bad at managing my time while I've been busy with detector stuff. Um, so I just mentioned as well that uh, we've also, a new development has been that uh, um, we've seen that the, the, the samples which are used for measuring the unitarity triangle angle gamma, um, B to, in particular B to DH with the D to K pi mode, um, we've seen that this is, can be beneficial to to analyze to perform combinations of uh, of the beauty and charm samples at the same time um, and this becomes because this is the same charm decay modes that we're studying for for example the wrong sign to right sign analysis 
Um, and this, this gamma measurement is also um, depends on the hadronic parameters. And so if we, if we perform combinations of the beauty and charm at the same time, then we, they can mutually benefit from the sensitivity that they, they offer. Um, and this just shows the different contributions and the improvements that the beauty modes are able to give for these uh, strong phase differences in the, the ratio of the um, doubly Kabibo suppressed to Kabibo favored. And this shows the improvement that, for example, this can give on the, the parameter Y. Uh, so this is not from any charm measurement. This improvement is not from any charm measurements. It's just from utilizing the, the, the sensitivity available in the beauty sample. Um, and so I'll try to wrap up now and, and say that, uh, as I've mentioned before, LHEB will begin taking data again shortly um, following a, a first upgrade. Um, but we've, we've also put together a document presenting the physics case for, for a second one. Uh, and you can see here the, the increases with respect to our run one and two data samples, which, uh, which we expect from, from our first upgrade. And then with the second one, we'll, we'll get the sample sizes will really explode. Um, and we'll, the, the, the possible sensitivity that we'll get to the, the CPV par parameters um, are shown here and we, yeah reach frighteningly, frighteningly good precisions that will uh, be huge experimental challenges to, to control the uncertainties. Um, and of course, we expect significant impact from Bell 2 as well, especially on modes containing neutral particles. Um, and uh, yeah, it was great to see a recent measurement of, of lifetimes and uh, more info and in, in prospects are available in the, the Bell 2 physics book. Um, so in summary, uh, CP violation and mixing are interesting places to look for new physics effects. And these are really exciting times um, as the unprecedented sample sizes have allowed for um, huge progress in recent years. The observation of CP violation and the decay, um, as well as huge improvements on the limits of mixing induced CP violation. Um, still a lot of work is still needed to fully characterize this though. So uh, um, yeah, look, look, stay tuned for, for more developments. Um, and thanks for your attention. And uh, sorry, it was a bit rushed at the end there. No, 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 sorry that I had to rush you off. I mean, you know, sorry, this is, uh, I, I didn't know from Jim like how much contingency we have, but okay, that, that, that's fine, you, you managed. So thank you very much. So, um, Yes, so so let's let's uh, see that if there are any questions coming from the June. So please raise your hand. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I see Jim. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, Nathan. Um, so th thanks a lot for that. Uh, comprehensive review of all the progress recently at LHCB. But I, I, this is a question I've asked before to others involved with the bin flip method. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you point out that there's going to be these huge statistics coming with the upgrade. Is there potentially a better binning to use that's uh, more robust, perhaps systematically or uh, would give more sensitivity or something because obviously if if, there, if that were the case those of us on best three should certainly look at perhaps measuring the the strong phase differences in a different in a different way or in a different division of the phase space right um so yeah i guess there's there's a in terms of different binning schemes uh, we can consider as you mentioned the systematic uh, possible improvements for systematic uncertainties um, as well as statistical uh, in the in the bin flip paper we we did some studies that showed the possible and statistical improvements and, um, and there was of course something to be gained with more bins but it wasn't huge um, but I, I think that is the, the question of systematic, from a systematic uncertainty point of view, it's also very interesting. Um, <clears throat> one, one point which uh, uh, I didn't really 
dive into the full details for partly because I'm, I'm short on time and partly because people usually find it tremendously boring, um, is how we take into account the, the effect of, uh, of mixing in this data-driven correction. Um, and that, that does, in order to remain model independent, um, we, we assume, well, we use the, 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 uh, the, the strong phase inputs themselves to, to, to predict what the effect of, of mixing will be for, for in, on this data-driven correction procedure. Um, and then doing so, we, we of course have to then assume that the, the strong phase is, is constant everywhere in the bin. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's, yeah, <laughs> that leads to a, a significant systematic uncertainty, which I think in principle would be reduced, um, for example, if there were more bins. Um, so my, my, my impression, and this is something that I've been, been wanting to study in more detail, is that, uh, that having more bins defined in the same way to try to keep constant strong phase differences would lead to um, better control of the systematic uncertainties. Um, um, but uh, yeah, I am, I'm unfortunately not able to, to provide a, an answer on how, qual how quantitative that is, a, a quantitative right. answer on how much. Uh, okay. No, yeah, that, that's interesting because I've got various answers from no to maybe to something <laughs> a little more concrete that you, you, you've said now. So uh, but anyway, yeah. the, the, the data's trickling in, but if we had an answer, I think next year at some point, that would be very helpful because we'd start we're starting to think about the next round of the Strong yeah, phase great. analysis. Great. Yeah, I'll try to do some uh, a bit more careful studies of, of exactly how much can be gained by that. Okay, so beyond the strong phase, uh, do we have uh, more comment? Actually, I have um, one or two very basic uh, live questions, if I can. So, uh, one on the uh, you know, I think you said in slide 41 or 42 about this um, pollution, let's say the B hadron pollution, like you want to yeah. measure the, so in the B factory, uh, uh, as you know, that we apply caught on so-called the distal momentum uh, evaluated in the center of mass frame. And we say, well, you know, this would be greater than this. So we clearly kill all the B to D distal, all, all this stuff. So what exactly is done at LSCB? I mean, probably I should read the paper more carefully, sort of the contamination of the pollution coming from the B going to C. Yeah. Um, so mo most of this background is, is suppressed by, by applying, um, by, by using the impact parameter basically um, for the- for Thanks the... to the word below. <laughs> yeah, thanks to the velo. Yeah, right. Because um, we can have pretty precise measurements of uh, of uh, if the d zero points directly back to the PV, um, and that's of course what we expect for the prompt sample. Uh, whereas, um, yeah, for the for this the sample coming from B, uh, that's less often the case. Um, of course, there there is still some contamination which we which we have to control um, mm. in this getting more and more challenging to control that as uh, as the sample sizes increase but uh, Correct. but we're uh, we're developing more and more tools to to study this and understand it better oh okay okay good um yeah i do not see anyone else so maybe i can have the luxury of asking the second question um yeah. so this is about uh, you know that time to time you you guys uh, amaze me like how we started with uh, no neutral particle no you know final state with um, missing energy but you do it right everything we say so that way it's really impressive to see the d0 to k sort k sort and uh, whatever you have with the lattice stages um so i was wondering like uh, uh, that what is your prospect uh, for let's say uh, for this D0 to K sort K sort, and, and if at all you can think of uh, with Pi zero or, or, or like, I mean, uh, thinking of the um, Dali's decay of Pi zero, obviously you cannot do for Pi zero to two photon, 
but the fact you have a huge sample, I mean, even if the LHD decay is uh, really tiny. So I, I was wondering for that because our theory colleague always say that K sort, K sort, pi zero, pi zero, or even things like isospin related decay in the D to pi pi system. So what are your prospect for those kind of study uh, when you go to the, let's say the next phase or next phase of the uh, experiment? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think especially for K short, K short, um, that's something that will, where we'll benefit from, uh, where did I have that slide? Um, yeah, in, in the, in the upgrade, we're going to be removing the hardware, the hardware trigger. trigger side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that will definitely help for case short, case short. Um, also, in the meantime, we're also uh, trying to develop more sophisticated algorithms for, for triggering on the case shorts. So mm -hmm. in, in, in run one and run two, we didn't we didn't have dedicated triggers in, in HLT1 for, for case shorts, but that's something that um, people are starting to work on and, and try to develop things for. Um, I think in general, the, the more flexible triggering mm -hmm. that we'll get, uh, that will definitely help for, for case short, case short. Um, for, for Pi Zeros, I don't think that we're going to see drastic improvements in the first okay. upgrade, um, oh. but uh, in, in the second upgrade, we're, we're looking to, um, yeah. There's still time to hopefully uh, improve our performance there. Okay, so you have some something left for us to look at with that build. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, I don't see. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, Sima. Yes, Sima, please go ahead. Yeah. I have a very okay. simple question. I just uh, recalled uh, looking at your slide 11 that you mentioned sometime the, about a non combinatorial background. What exactly you meant by that? Did I hear it right? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, the, so, so um, uh, where was that? So there, there are um, non combinatorial backgrounds which are which are present. Uh, one of these can be the the backgrounds coming from um, B hadron decays, uh, which I, I uh, explained that we we tried to control that using the impact parameter, for instance. Um, but we can also have have backgrounds coming from misidentified hadrons, which uh, I mean we we have good control over that, but. Uh, the, the precision of these measurements are so high that uh, that these are still things that we we have to consider and do dedicated studies for. Um, okay, so you call these as the non-combinatorial ones. Yeah, right. but yeah. for 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 combinatorial, I mean basically uh, a random d zero, a random association of a d zero and a, a, a tagging pion. Right. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thanks, Bethan. Yeah. Uh, Yes, so what we call in well, uh, Sima partially reconstructed or something, something. It's not peaking background in not that peaking, sense. Not in peaking, not yeah, the right. yes. Right. Okay. I mean, something misreconstructed. Okay, so so Jim, uh, yeah, you probably yeah, have the so, last. Yeah. Okay, sorry to prolong things a little more, but uh, I had uh, just uh, wondering about prospects uh, for charm baryon and looking mm. at lambda C decays and things. Is that uh, being worked on at all? Because I, I, I guess if you can see the singly Kabibo suppressed in large numbers, that becomes very interesting. Um, yeah, that's that's true. I didn't. Uh, I, I think I unfortunately didn't do do full justice to the the time integrated measurements. But um, I guess I would have done an even worse uh, job of staying on time. Um, but yeah, we, we do have, we do it. We are working on uh, uh, searches for, for CP violation and, and charm variants as well. Okay, so I should await another surprise from LHCB in that, <laughs> in that regard. All right. that, that, thanks, Nathan. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I think uh, let's thank uh, Nathan for a very nice talk. And he said uh, he was busy in the hardware. So, you know, so he still managed to an excellent talk, uh, and uh, so thank you very much. And uh, Jim, I mean, I guess this is this closes the system. Uh, sorry, says on today, right? Yeah. So this is the end today, and uh, and we start again at eleven tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. So thanks and all. Yeah.